introduce Dr. Gonzalo de la Camara. He is first a great advocate to uh, spend a lot of money in the water and he's an important support to uh, IDA, I think, to allowing him to do so. Dr. De La Camara is a global economist. The European Union and the European Parliament Special Advisor and also he is a policy advisor to many organizations such World Bank, UN Water, UNDP, FAO and you name it. Uh, Dr. Gonzalo he is a, a Spanish economist working globally out of 80 countries in Europe Latin America, MENA, Central and South Asia, a specialist in the economic management of natural resources, water, climate change, energy, atmospheric pollution, biological diversity and ecosystem services. With emphasis on their complex linkage to economic and social development. Mr. De La Camara works for multilateral organizations such as the European Commission, of which he is a water policy uh, advisor, and also uh, for uh, the UN Agency program, the World Bank, including its 2030 Water Resources Group. So please. Welcome Dr. Gonzalo to tell us more about the water circle economy, the crossroads to sustainability. Dr. Gonzalo. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank the ITA for inviting me uh, to deliver this dinner speech. And especially, I'd like to thank uh, President Ivanka and of course, Secretary General uh, Shannon McCarthy for trusting me to, to share with you some ideas today. It's, it's really an honor to be uh, with you discussing these issues. And I'm interested very much about the, the, the key word that was used to name the World Congress this idea of the crossroads, because uh, it's clearly a sort of a tipping point for this organization, and it's been mentioned this very morning that this organization has proved its strength in terms of technology. But it's really interesting for an economist by background like me, when I look at this allegation and reflect what you want to reduce, and I realize that you excel at delivering new technologies, but sometimes we see that the level of penetration, the rate of penetration of these technologies in the market in order to tackle societal challenges is not that high in many regions. So the question is why? If, if technology is available, if money, according to anything that I discussed with international investors, is also available, what's the, what's the problem? What's the drawback? And what I see very much is that the drawback is about governance. It's about mastering complexity. It's about designing the right policies and creating dividing incentives for these technologies to be in place. As many of your countries have done already, but we, we see still some potential to be in, in, in other countries. Right. I know already you heard of this man, uh, Sigmund Boyman. He became like a fetish sociologist. And, and what, what this man uh, used to say when he wrote this book about liquid modernity is that not uh, anymore we can deal with the, the future in the way we used to because we are facing a huge cascade of uh, uncertainty. Yeah, and this is the, the first block of what I'm going to say. Yeah, we are facing a, a very significant cascade of uncertainties, which means that we are continuously dealing with a moving target. Right. We are continuously dealing with a moving target. Right. So the point here is that when you try to project out about the potential of desalination and water reuse, we could choose a path that is to become self-indulgent, come here to this wonderful Dubai, by the way, thanks to Dewa for, for hosting this, this event, and 
thinking that because we excel at delivering technologies, all is sorted out and we will be able to unveil the huge potential of desalination and water reuse. But the point I'm trying to make is that unless we take into account, unless we factor in complex elements of the context, we will fail to deliver in many geographical contexts. Yeah? In order to, to put it in a completely different way, now that I'm seeing here uh, people from Singapore, not everything, not every country is Singapore. So we can take that successful experience on water reuse and pretend that we can extrapolate it to, to other countries as such. We need to think about the enabling factors, about the enabling conditions that make these technologies work and deliver. So the first level of uncertainty has to do with global change. Yeah. And we often put the emphasis on saying that global climate change is, uh, is global by definition, so it affects us all. But the point that I'm interested in is that it's global, but it's not symmetric, which means that it's not affecting everyone in the same way. If you look at the meta region here, you will see that it's projected to have a higher increase in, global, in temperature than global average. Yeah? So this means that the impact in a region like this, for instance, or anywhere in the Mediterranean is higher than in other areas of the, of the globe. The effort to be made by the international community is huge. We have assumed that we need to introduce a structural change in our productive models in order to work in a different way, in a low carbon economy, in green economies. But the point is that we are failing to comply with our own international commitments. The last summit in the UN in September this year was a bit disappointing. It was a bit disappointing in terms of finding new global commitments to mitigate uh, climate change. And there's something even more important. When you, we discuss about climate change, the poor passing in all these discussions is climate change adaptation. So I struggle to see why, if energy is critical and the transition of the energy model is critical to climate change mitigation, we have not acknowledged as a society that climate change adaptation is mainly based on changes that we make to the water cycle. So I think we should assume that energy is to mitigation what water is to adaptation. But for whatever reason, adaptation is the poor passing of all these international discussions. When you look at this, it's quite striking. Yeah? And there's a lot of scientific evidence that shows that even if there's a very high level of consensus in the international community about climate change, when you look at the media, the skepticism arises, and when you talk to the general public, people completely unplug. If you present things about climate change in an apocalyptic fashion, yeah, people disconnect because they say we are not so important in order to introduce a change. But if you say, Climate change is the outcome of thousands of millions of individual decisions every day. People also are black because they feel too small to make the change. So we need to find the right narrative, the right storytelling in order to convey everything we know about scientific evidence of climate change. And I think that a lot has to do with what, with what are the real, the actual benefits, the opportunities for society around climate change adaptation, which the way I say it, is a generational challenge. Right. The second level of uncertainty has to do with our current economic outlook. Yeah? So if you look at this very sensitive indicator yeah, for the US economy, you see that for the last 50 years, it has always predicted properly a new recession. So we might be facing a new global recession. And this will, of course, affect all public and private investment uh, uh, efforts. But when you look at whatever's happening in terms of trade, you see this clear decrease in trade activity in the world, which is also affecting the global activity on economic ground. And what John Maynard Keynes, a renowned economist in, back in the 30s, used to call animal spirits, yeah, this idea that we also need to build on expectations. And expectations are clearly deteriorating these days. Yeah, as you can see, using an index uh, for all these different countries in, in the world. Yeah, you see it's becoming reddish. Okay? So the important thing is that it's not just about our concern about the current economic outlook. It's very much that we also need to face structural changes in our economy that not only have to do with the transition of the energy model, they also have to do very much with 
the transition of the economy from a conventional one to a digital one. And uh, I have to say, the water sector is, is, is running late in terms of digitalization. <laughs> yes, it has some advantages as well. You can learn from mistakes from others. But the important thing is that there will be a massive structural change in the way we look at things. Desalination is one when you look at it in a non-digital world, but it's another one when you think about it as an urgent need to deal with data and to introduce artificial intelligence and blockchain technologies, etc. Right. Uh, when you look at specifically at the water sector, what you see is first, there's a very complex blend of financing sources for, uh, for these sorts of technologies. But the second point, the chart on your right hand side, shows that financial, uh, commercial financiers tend to focus on like the small sectors of activity. So sometimes we find massive investments in wastewater treatment, yeah? but it's not that all water risks are being faced at once. And this is more important. I don't know whether there's someone from the World Bank or any of the multilateral development bank in the room, but when you look at this, you realize this is for India, that the level of absorption of available liquidity for these technologies is not being properly uh, taken advantage of, right? So we still face challenges in terms of using the money that is available out there. Right, and as I said, this is coming in, in an era in which we have to face the digitalization of the economy. And the digitalization of the economy and the use of new technologies may sound very promising for a sector like this. So there's a lot of talking about uh, ceramic uh, membranes. There's a lot of talking about new ways of dealing with hypersaline brine. So it's clear that as someone mentioned this morning in the, in the honorary council session, it's clear that this is a very active, dynamic community in terms of facing technological challenges. But this is not enough. Yeah? Right. Let's go to the point that I want to make. As an economist, I'm obsessed with this idea of incentives. Yeah? What is driving the way we behave? Why do we make decisions the way we do? And the main reason for that will explain why all these countries, not in 2040, all these countries are now subject to the structural, chronic, long-term water scarcity, those in red. And this has reached the public opinion. You can see the front page of the New York Times using this study back in August of the World Resources Institute, a think tank based in Washington, D.C. Right? When you look at the ranking of countries that are more water stressed, you see that out of the 17 more water stressed countries in the world, 12 of them are in your region, 12 of them are in the Middle East, yeah? which is of course the most vulnerable region to climate change. Yeah? And which probably explains why you have like something like 50% of all installed capacity of desalination in the world. You already know that you need it to react to this massive risk. Right, but this is something happening, for instance, in Chennai, yeah? Almost five million people living in this Indian city which is running out of water. This is the new Cape Town. Cape Town was in the news not long ago, and for instance, now that I listen to the Deputy Minister from Peru, we know that if there's no significant rainfall in Greater Lima, yeah, that means more than 10 million people, yeah, if there's no significant rainfall in the next two years, they might be facing in a situation like this. So, some of the measures that have been adopted by national water policy take their time to be more mature, yeah? And therefore, we need to find solutions for these kind of problems. But the point that I want to make is that the challenge, the policy challenge, is not drought. Drought is just by, by the acute manifestation of chronic problem. And the chronic problem is long-term water scarcity, which is affecting northern Chile, the Peruvian coast of Peru, northern Argentina, Singapore, the Middle East, all the Mediterranean countries, South Australia, all Western states in the US. So we know that this problem has nothing to do with whether your ear is wet or not. When you look at the potentially the fifth 
economy in the world, California, if you treat that as an independent state, yeah, in terms of GDP, is the fifth economy of the world. After a drought event of five years, yeah, you could see images like this. In 2015, all these dead almond trees, yeah, and you could see the agricultural sector, probably the most thrilling agricultural sector in the world, the Californian one, being seriously threatened by the left quarter. When you look at whatever's happening in Australia, you see this again and again. After the millennium drought, 14 years in a row of drought, they introduce a major legal reform that, from my viewpoint, is not delivering as expected. And it has some unintended outcomes as well, yeah, on environmental ground. But what happens if you look at Germany, and please note that I'm not mentioning less developed countries when using these examples. Why? Because I feel that the potential for desalination and reclaimed water reuse are not just in less developed countries. And I think the developed countries should commit in order to make these things possible, because if there's more investment in more developed economies, we will see the unit marginal cost of all these technologies going down and down, and that will be a contribution for less developed areas in the world. This is wild tomatoes in the banks of the River Rhine in Bonn, Germany, yeah? the top one economy in the European Union. Yeah? Unexpected. And this is happening now in summertime. In summertime last year in Helsinki, there were more than 30, year, 30 days with no rainfall at all. Irrigation canals in Eindhoven in the Netherlands were drying up. This is unprecedented. It's never seen before, right? So we know that we're facing problems not just in the Middle East, not just in South American countries, not just in, we're facing troubles as well in more developed economies. Look at this, the iconic, humid London city, yeah, was like this in summer. Yeah, this is Greenwich Park, yeah, and you can see that parched grass in, in Greenwich Park. And when you look at London, London is a very good example. Most people tend to ignore the 25% of water supply in London comes from desalination. There's been an, an, an interesting diversification of water supply sources in a city that is completely different if you look at it with commuters and tourists, and when you look at it when commuters and tourists leave, both to the hotels or other homes. Yeah, the city completely changes, and this is a global city. So the way of planning and the diversification of water supply sources has become a critical issue for the resilience of these global cities as well. When you look at the US, what you see in these green dots is a major study by the, by the uh, MIT. And the MIT identified that there is a correlation in these green dots between uh, water stress, yeah, so the gap between long-term availability of water and water demands, and also between, uh, uh, like, the existence, the abundance of a lot of brackish water in the aquifers. Yeah? So in those green dots, you could use systems com com combining groundwater exploitation and desalination of brackish water, and this has been identified as a huge opportunity. There's something called the Water Security Grant Challenge that is planning to fund all these investments uh, in the next few years. So again, potential in a more developed economy as well, not just in less developed countries. And why do we make the decisions we make? If you look at this example, this is the largest uh, copper mine site in the world. It's called Mina Escondida. It's in northern Chile. It produces like 1.5 million tons of copper every year. And when you look at it, you realize that they're using water from the Pacific, they desalinate in the Pacific, and they pump water up to 3,100 meters of altitude. 3,100 meters of altitude. It may sound crazy, yeah? How do we manage to get the water to these places? What about the massive energy investment, not in desalination, but in pumping, yeah? This is paid off by the international commodity market. So this is paid off by international copper prices. But if copper prices slow down, yeah, they may face challenges. Right. The last point that I want to make in this presentation is very much about circular economies. The, the idea of circularity approach, uh, 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 both to water reuse and desalination in, in itself. Right. This is what you know about the goods that you consume every day. You buy a good, 
uh, throughout its timeline, yeah, you lose value. Okay? It's a downward slope. But when you look at this, it drives the opposite. In a circular economy approach, with the passing of time, you add value in the process. So circularity is very much about a new value proposition. Yeah? And again, you don't need to be Singapore. It's great to be in the last stage of that because Singapore is, is, is able to deliver, yeah? But you can choose rationally other steps in these uh, uh, stirs in order to add value to your processes in wastewater treatment, in reclaimed water reuse, and in the desalination of brackets and seawater. Right. As, for instance, San Diego did. Look at this. This is the challenge. The challenge is very much one of tackling long-term water security within a context of climate change adaptation. And when you look at this, you see the diversification of water supply sources in San Diego. So this is possible. This can be done. The problem has to do, of course, with the unique price of all these technologies. So we still have a chance. And I want to be very harsh with this. Yeah? With the current pricing schemes, there's no way we'll be able to deal with climate change adaptation. We need to change our pricing schemes in order to reflect not just the willingness to pay of users for the service they receive from water companies, but also their willingness to pay for long-term water security, as if they were paying for some sort of insurance policy. Because in fact, that's what we're doing. We're protecting ourselves from risk. And as I said, this is based on rational decisions. So the first thing you can do is to decide on the advanced wastewater treatment train that you want to follow. There's no one single option, as you well know. You need to decide and reflect in your public policy what are the parameters in terms of public health that you want to comply with. You need to choose in terms of ultrafiltration technologies and see which one is fit for the purpose of what you want to do nationally, regionally, or at a larger scale. And when you look at best practices in the world, yeah, California, Singapore, Namibia, etc., what you see is that there is no single way. There are many options, yeah? This is not about dogma. This is very much about being able to choose on the basis of rational criteria. And one important thing, it's critical to look at the blend because we are continuously making mistakes in public policy when, for instance, we apply advanced treatment to wastewater treatment to wastewater effluents, and then we want that water to be reused by farmers, and farmers say, no, we need more nutrients. Oh, but nutrients were removed in the treatment process, and then we need to add them all again. Or the same applies, for instance, to this, uh, I think, myth about the concentration of boron in desalinated water. Yeah, you talk to farmers and they say, we don't want to use desalinated water because it has a very high concentration of boron. And you say, okay, what do you do if you don't have water from the desalination plant? And they say, we use water from the aquifer. Okay, but the aquifer, for instance, in my country, my home country in Spain, in southeastern Spain, is highly overexploited. So it means that the concentration in the aquifer is higher than that you get from the desalination plant. So, you know, let's be honest about this. And let me just finish with a, with a social experiment. What happens if I tell you that you could drink water, including this beautiful cockroach, yeah? If I tell you that both the glass and the water and the cockroach have been completely sterilized, 100% sterilized. If I ask these, not this audience, if I ask the general public, most people would say, I would never drink that water. Even if you ensure that everything's ready to be drunk. Right? What happens if I ask you a second question? Would you drink apple juice, nice apple juice, from this urinal? Probably you would say, no, no. You know, I, I'd rather go for a Coke, or I'd rather go for a tea, or I'd rather go, right? Well, this is not my social experiment. This is Paul Rosens. Yeah, he's a professor of psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. And the point he made is written in his quote. The point he made is very often, we tend to overlook or we tend to downplay public perception about these issues. And very often it is the case that once you overcome technological, financial, policy, governance challenges, you still have to face the public. Yeah? And public opinion still matters. Okay? Well, thank you very much indeed.